sort of braving the, the misty yuckiness out there, the beginning of the cold, wet stuff. Um, and thanks for inviting me, MAA. That, this is an honor and uh, a pleasure. Um, you know, I, I, will, I will do, so one, ground rules of this talk. Interrupt me as much as you like, ask questions. I'm a professional, I can handle it. So again, um, also, I'll try my best to not make anyone groan or whatever with too much in the way of puns or things like that, but, but there are, I, you know, origami talks, it does accidentally happen. Um, for example, I've never given a talk in the carrot house, you know, and I've heard about this space for so, so, you know, many years, and lots of really prestigious mathematicians have, have got, you know, spoken here, but it's okay, I fold under pressure. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, so what I want to do with this talk is literally talk about uh, folding a new tomorrow. Uh, the, the general thing I want you to get a sense of when you leave here is that um, you know origami's cool, and yeah, origami has lots of intersections with with math and stuff like that. I want you to get, have a sense of that. But recently, like over the past five years or so, there's been a big interest in, um, from a lot of people, from um, mathematicians to engineers to physicists, to really look at origami as inspiration in applications. Um, and the question is why, <laughs> uh, and where is that going, what's that all about? I want to try to emphasize that. That's what the first part of the title is, is for. So origami, paper folding, you probably already know that. Um, and when we study origami, a lot of times we look at, um, we compare the finished model that we fold with something called the crease pattern. So general rules in origami is no cutting, uh, you can, most people like to start with a square piece of paper, but that, you don't have to. There are people who start with hexagons, you know, or <laughs> rectangles. And then there are, there's origami that, well, I'll talk about that later. But, um, but yeah, but this crease pattern idea is what you get when you take your origami model, like this, uh, this flapping bird or this crane, and you unfold it, and you look at just the creases that are used in the final folded model, and, you know, and, uh, this is one of the things that really inspired me to get excited and interested in origami math. And that's like, you know, when I first unfolded an origami model and looked at this and thought, gee, there's got to be some geometry going on in there, right? I mean, look, I figured there were rules. I didn't know what they were, but, you know. Oh, and um, we also distinguish between what are called mountain creases and valley creases. Those words are meant to be self-explanatory, but if you're looking at one side of the paper, uh, a valley crease is a crease that makes a valley and a mountain kind of comes out at you. And of course, if you flip it over, everything switches. But, um, but there's an interplay there between mountains and valleys. That's also part of the, the math and stuff. Um, now, traditional origami goes back, well, no one really knows, 1600s Japan, something like that. Um, and these are classic origami models. The, this is the classic Japanese crane, uh, I believe the oldest a reference to that people have found is in like 1625 or something. And this is the classic traditional Japanese frog. That's a little bit newer, maybe 1700s or something. Uh, but still, you see these in a lot of origami books. They're really old models. And they're really elegant, too. They're, they're, no part of the paper is wasted. They're very economical. Um, but modern origami is a little different. Uh, this is Robert Lang's Black Forest Cuckoo Clock which is folded from one rectangle of paper. So it's not a square, it's a rectangle. Really? <clears throat> no cuts. Even the leaves? Even the leaves. Yep. Uh, it's also kind of fun because if you pull on the pendulum, the cuckoo comes out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it does not tell the correct time, uh, except for twice a day. So uh, he invented that in 1987. Can you do that? Yes, but I never have. Um, so maybe I don't really know. I'm confident that I could. <laughs> It's like 280 steps, and uh, you start with a big one, and it ends up being this small. And, yeah. But it's cool. I mean, yeah. um, these are Kawasaki roses. Uh, Kawasaki is Toshikazu Kawasaki. He's a Japanese mathematician. Um, and some people look at this and don't immediately think origami. You think maybe like tissue paper roses. But if you were to unfold one of these and look at the crease pattern, it's very geometrical. There's, there are no curved creases in this. It's all straight lines, and it kind of, it's, it uses something called a square twist, for those of you who know a little more about it. And, and, and that's what's making it give it this really lyrical shape. But it's very mathematical. Now, really complicated models can also be fun to analyze. This is Zhong Mayakawa's devil. I have one of these here. 
Really fun. Again, one square piece of paper, no cuts. And if you want to make one of your own, there you go. Right? So um, that's the crease pattern. And, uh, but there are, and you know, there are many times in this talk where I'm going to say, like, we could spend a whole talk on just this. And this is one of those times we could spend a whole talk just studying how crease patterns work. What, you know, how, how would you go from wanting to fold something like this to a crease pattern like that? You know, like, what, you know, um, there's actually a really good TED talk by Robert Lang on exactly that topic if you want to learn more about that. It's, it's really kind of fun because, um, because it's really, once you get the hang of well, folding and the math behind it, which you'll see a little bit of today, um, this bridge really isn't that bad. Yeah. yeah. Does he have some different convention about mountains and valleys? Because I don't see any dot, dot, dots. In oh, right, yeah. I, I did not highlight the, the mountains and valleys here. Um, and surely, yeah, if you use different mountains and valleys than what you should use, you might get something a little bit different. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, I just chose not to highlight that here. One could. Uh, there is a certain set of mountains and valleys that will give you this. Actually, what this gives you is what's called the base for this. Like, notice how the fingers have little kinks in them to make them look like I'm clawing you. Th those creases aren't on here. But these are the fingers right up here. And those are the other fingers. Yeah? Uh, how large a square would you typically start with? Um, Kind of depends on your folding skill and, and, uh, and masochistic nature. I don't know. <laughs> but this was from a two foot square. And yeah, it collapses down a lot. One thing that's interesting about this is that this much of the paper is all in the head. Like three quarters of the paper is the head. <laughs> because the head has so much detail. It's got, it's got a chin, a tongue, a nose, eyes, horns, ears. It's, like, uh, it's rather top heavy if you actually hold it. Um, Whereas the body doesn't need as much paper. Go figure. But if you think that's crazy, so so Jean Maikawa invented this in I think 1986 or 84. That's when a, a, one revolutionary wave of origami was happening, and 2000 another revolutionary wave happened. Oh, wait, yeah, question. One? You said he invented it as opposed to designed it. Yeah, invented, designed. Um, what was different? Well, you're getting all philosophical on me. <laughs> Did someone invent? The crane, the traditional Japanese crane, I'm sure someone did, but it's so natural, it's so economical, someone else would have discovered it if he did. So, same thing kind of here. Um, I forget, what word did I use, invented or discovered? Invented. I used invented. Eh, I can go either way. <laughs> because this is really, an econ I can very, no part of the paper is wasted from this. I was like, it was meant to be folded, in a sense, because everything comes together so nicely. Except it's a devil dude, not a crane, so it feels kind of weird to say that it was meant to be folded. But, um, uh, but I guess I say invented because there's so, there, there are very conscious design decisions that go into making something like this. And that if someone else was to have the idea to do something like this, it would probably come out a little bit different. Um, might not be exactly the same, especially as they get more complicated. So I see it as a design process and therefore kind of more an invention than a discovery. But, you know, do we invent theorems? Do we discover them? That's... Anyway, origami. Satoshi Kamiya, he's a, well in 2000 he was a young and upcoming boulder, and now, he's, now it's 15 years later, so I don't know what you call him now. But look, he made this wasp. People had made origami wasps before to the year 2000, but not with, I mean, check it out, there's little like toes. Well, okay, wasps don't have toes, but they have little <laughs> things. And, and the head is really cool, and the abdomen is plated like, like a wasps might look like, you know. Um, yeah, and look at the crease pattern. Um, what's interesting here is that you see the same kind of triangles you saw in the other crease patterns we saw, but then there's this crazy thing. That is something called an origami tessellation that gives you the patterning on the abdomen. And he literally grafted that onto the crease pattern. How does that work? Well, a guy like Satoshi, he's one of these people who was born to fold, and you just have to meet him to know what that, he's always folding paper, and he's got something hardwired in his brain. It's, it's crazy, but he's a really cool guy. English isn't so good, but, um, <laughs> but he's, he's, he's a lot of fun. And uh, he just has this in his brain, how to get that to work. And it was probably a lot of experimentation and trial and error and stuff. Um, other types of origami, yes, origami tessellations. That's where your crease pattern is some tiling of the plane, and it happens to actually fold into something. Uh, this is called a square twist tessellation. One of the early practitioners of that is 
with Sujo Fujimoto in the 1970s, um, they're really fun to fold. Uh, they can be really challenging because oftentimes everything has to fold at the same time for it to collapse. But what's also neat is that because the, the crease pattern is so regular, um, the layerings of the paper are also very regular. So if you actually fold one of these things and hold it up to the light, you get some really nice patterns. So these are some tessellations I made while in grad school when I should have been writing my dissertation. Um, and these are more complicated. They're based on other types of tessellations. This is a 3464 tessellation, if you know the notation, and this is a 3636. Um, but, but these are folded on a tissue, like really thin, almost tissue-like paper. And so you can, so the different shadings you see are the different layers of paper um, of the final model. But again, no cuts, one piece of paper. Um, and this is the kind of technique that Satoshi was grafting into his wasp to get the, the abdomen to be like that. Kind of cool. So if we ask ourselves, we ask ourselves, what, um, what are the connections between origami and math? And I answer almost whatever you want. Um, uh, you could, well, with probably some exceptions, because I can always think of some exceptions, name me a branch of mathematics, and I could, mention, I could come up with some way origami intersects with it. Um, obviously, there's intersections with geometry, because you look at the crease pattern, there's clear geometry going on there, angles, triangles, things <laughs> that look cool. But there's also uh, ways you can use linear algebra in origami as a way to model it. We'll see a little bit of that in, in a moment. There's a lot of combinatorics in graph theory. Um, you guys will get your hands dirty with something like that in a little bit. Um, and even things that don't really say origami at all, like statistical mechanics, uh, analysis, differential geometry, topology, actually those branches of math are, there are elements of those branches of math that have been used also to model origami processes. I want to try to hit as many of these as I can today, but I won't be able to. There's just too many. Um, but it all has to do with how many different aspects there are to folding processes that are really interesting and that have patterns going on with them and therefore have math that could be exploited. Yeah. So um, I've actually documented a lot of this in a book, not the one that I'm still trying to write. This is a book called Project Origami that's um, written for teachers on how to use origami to teach various math subjects, which is a lot of fun. I mean, I'm a teacher. I love to teach and, you know, there, there's, there's, in almost any one of my classes, if the stu the stu my students all find out that I do origami sooner or later, and they're like, let's fold something instead of doing whatever we're doing in class. And I usually acquiesce at least a few times. And luckily, there's lots of ways I can say in a calculus class, say, yeah, we'll fold something, but then we're doing calculus, and they don't know it. And that's yeah, can we go back to? Get back to? One, two? Um, no, yeah. one more. OK, three. Uh, no, one more way on that. The last. No, I got forward. I got there was one there. Yeah, maybe it is this one that if you're only allowed to fold along the creases. Yep. Most of them, like the whole main diagonal, is a crease or something like that. That I can understand how you start. I don't even see how you get started on. Oh this. right, yeah. Well, actually, if you were going to fold this in real life, you would probably make a whole bunch of auxiliary creases that help you locate where all these little diagonals are supposed to go, but aren't actually used in the finished model. That's something that happens a lot. Like, if I was to unfold this crane, um, there are a bunch of creases that I didn't actually use. Like, let's see, like, like this main diagonal. I folded it when I actually made this, but I didn't use it in the end. In the end, those wings did not get folded along that line. So, um, so yeah, okay. if I was to actually fold this, I'd probably first fold a whole grid, like a 16 by 16 grid. I didn't know that was legal. Oh yeah, I mean, whatever, it's all legal, you just can't rip, no ripping, no cuts, no scissors. <laughs> but you can fold lots of things, and then you pick, carefully pinch all these diagonals, and then go make it go whoosh, and then you get that. And this is a computer drawing, so you don't see all the messiness that might happen if I showed you a real one. But, and if I, this was a higher resolution picture, you could look at this and be like, ah, I see some extra creases here. You know, but, it's, and here you probably can see them. I had to do lots of extra pieces in this to get the geometry to work. But that kind of makes it prettier too. It's almost snowflake-like. Any other questions before I have you guys fold something? Yeah, what's tessellation? It's a it's a fancy word for tiling. <laughs> tiles. 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 It's like your bathroom floor tiles or whatever. That's what. Like imagine you had a bathroom floor that looked like that. Yeah. Then you could try to fold it. 
So, and the numerical designation of the tessellation? Oh, yeah. that, that's a, yeah, that's like a, so this one's easier to see. <clears throat> 3636 means that, if, that the symmetry of this, if I take a point, like say this point here, I got a triangle symmetry, then a hexagon, then a triangle, then a hexagon. And that's, that pattern repeats all over. So it's a way of like notating how this is, you know, what kind of geometry is, like here I have something with threefold geometry, sixfold, and then this is three, four, six, four. So let's see, if I go around here, I get a triangle here, then a square, then a hexagon, then a square, then back to my triangle. That unit is repeated all over the place. Mm -hmm. So it's just like a notation that people have come up with to denote mm -hmm. tilings. You can classify all, all, all uniform tilings of the plane you can classify this way, but it's, uh, it's a fun math subject. Yeah. Math, yeah. Okay. All right, so you got a piece of paper. Uh, hopefully, you also have a pen, or your neighbor has a pen, so you can draw a dot in the center of your paper. And I'm going to do that too. So I'm going to get a bigger piece of paper. Um, so I want you to make a point, roughly in the center. It doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, are we roughly ready? This is not complicated. You're not going to get lost here. This is, this is interactive learning. So this is IBL. We're, we're doing it. Okay? Um, so, <laughs> the education jokes don't work so <laughs> Anyway, um, you got a dot. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to make a fold, any fold, I don't care what angle or what, but it's got to go through the dot all the way across the paper. So I'm making it like this so I can still see the dot. And I make a crease. And there you go. Fold through your dot. And leave it folded. Okay. Are you good? Yep. Leave it folded. I want you to do it again. Make another crease. Where you another fold, but it's got to go through the dot. So again, it could be anything. I'm going to make mine look like this. But everyone's is going to be different. That's good. Okay. Yep, leave it folded. Okay. Now, you can stop right there if you wanted. Or you can keep going. You can do this as many times as you want, but you know if you do it a million times, it will be here a long time. So, so I'm going to do mine one more time. You can do yours one or two more times. You can turn yours over and do it there or something. But at some point, say, okay, I've had enough. But you always have to go through always the dot. Always go through the dot. And not unfold anything. And not unfold anything until the very end. Until, you're, until you've decided you're done. I've decided I'm done. Yeah, you just, it just gets skinnier and it's more thick and it gets difficult. But try to give it a good solid crease too. No wimpy creases here. Got to make the paper feel your, your rack. So when you've decided you're done, oh, that's good. When you've decided you're done, I want you to carefully unfold it all and look at what you've done. Um, look at your creases. Your creases, your, your dot should have a lot of creases coming out of it. Some of them are mountains, and some are valleys. I want you to count how many mountains you have coming out, and how many valleys you have coming out. And then I want you to tell me how many mountains, how many valleys. Seven. Three mountains, four valleys. Three mountains, four valleys. Check again. Four and two. Four and two. Okay. Four and two. Five and three. What did you say? Five mountains, three valleys. Okay. Three mountains. Oh, so like this. Yeah. Okay, does that make sense? That someone might have five and three, and another person might have three and five? Sure. They'll just turn it over and get the same. Four and two. Four and two. Ooh. Anyone else have something different? Ten and seven. Ten and seven. No. Count again. <laughs> Three one. Three one. That's somebody stopped after the first two. That's good. Four and two. Four and two. Yeah, we got four. Four and six. What? Four and six. Four and six. Nine and seven. Nine and seven. Wow. There you go. 
Okay, so five dollars you say? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, and the next one are one, two, three, four, five. How did you fold the others? I think you might have uh, increased that. Didn't actually fold. <laughs> okay, so let's see. I think maybe there was one that wasn't counted. So now mounting go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, five is up. Okay. No, you're right. I like that. I think I, I heard nine and five or something like that. Well, five and seven is good. I like that. Yes. Six and eight. Six and eight. Okay, so what pattern are people seeing here? It's always a difference of two. It's called Mayakawa's theorem. It's the same Mayakawa who invented the little devil dude that we were looking at. Um, Jung Mayakawa is a Japanese physicist. He, he does math as a result. And uh, yeah, it goes like this. It's, this is a, something that's true for any vertex, any point in an origami model that's flat. That's, you know, because this is something that you could press in a book without crumbling, as opposed to like a 3D origami model like some of these I have here. They're not flat. If I pressed this, it would, it would crush and add more creases. But if you have any origami model, like this crane I was folding, most origami models that you find in books are flat. Like you fold a zebra or something, and it's flat. This crane is flat. Um, if I was to look at the crease pattern of this, look at any vertex, and count the mountains and valleys, I'd have n minus b is either plus 2 or minus 2. What about 1 and 0? You're supposed to make one fold. Ah, uh, that's a good question. If you made one fold, where's the vertex? Right on. There. How many mountains? Two. <laughs> and zero valleys. That's still good. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I mean, that's kind of a silly case. Like, is there really a vertex there? I don't know. But, but it works. It still works. Um, let's quickly see a proof. Uh, this is something I love to give to my students. It's actually not that easy to prove um, because there are weird things that can happen. Uh, for the proof, and this is something we do a lot in origami, unfortunately. For the proof, we do a little bit of uh, origami mutilation. Um, we allow ourselves to cut for the sake of proof, is what I'm saying. So, like here I have a big vertex. This vertex is different than any of the ones you folded because um, notice none of these creases go all the way through the paper. That can happen. If you're, if you're careful about how you make your creases, you can have it fold like that. And a lot of origami models have that, like this crane that I was showing has some vertices like this. Um, so you can't have an argument that relies on one of the creases going all the way through. But suppose you had a vertex and it folds flat, and so you fold it flat, and then you cut off the, the vertex. And that gives you a cross section. Okay, so, and it's actually going to be a polygonal cross section. It's a straight line. You can imagine opening it up a little bit, but it, it, you could have all angles in that being zero or 360 if they're bending around. Um, we can still think of it as a polygon. And that's useful because then I can do the classic proof by monorail. I don't know if you've seen this proof technique before. It's very useful. Um, and I'm not kidding. It's, yeah. Uh, now, this is supposed to be a monorail, not like a finger with a purple finger with teal nail polish. <laughs> but this is a monorail going on the cross section from top, cutting off the vertex. Okay? And so the question is, what's that monorail going to do as it travels around this whole polygon? Well, for one thing, we have to kind of look at this and be like, imagine we're looking at it from above. So this is a, uh, who knows, that might be a mountain crease. That might be a mountain crease, but then this one's a valley, right? Because it's going the other way. And then this is going to be another mountain. All right? So every time, so if this monorail comes here, it hits the mountain crease, it's going to rotate like 180 degrees. Because remember, this is supposed to be flat. And then it's going to hit this one and rotate 180 degrees. But then it's going to hit this one, and what's it going to do? Same. But in the other direction. It'll go like minus 180 degrees. And, and then it'll do positive 180 degrees. So, so every time it hits a mountain, it's going to rotate by, let's say, positive 180 degrees. And every time it hits a valley, it's going to rotate by negative 180 degrees. And how much turning does it do at, at, when it comes back to the beginning? 360. 360, because it goes around in a circle, mm -hmm. really, right? So you get this lovely equation that 180 times all the mountains, that's how much rotation the mountains give, 
minus 180 times all the values has to equal 360 in the end. Boom! Divide by two. Students love to do that. And, um, and there you go. And that, and that was us looking at from above, where these were mountains and that was a valley. If you looked at it from below, that would have been switched. You would have gotten minus two. Does that make sense? It's a, proofs are fun. Yeah. Um, so quickly, what other types of things? So I want to do like a really quick survey of other types of math. And then I want to get into applications of like why we care. Um, as we've already mentioned, there's a lot of geometry in origami. Uh, if I had more time, again, we could spend a whole hour on this if we wanted. Uh, I could hand you all a piece of paper and I could teach you how to trisect an angle with origami, something you can't do with straight edge and compass. There's all sorts of really cool origami geometry things you can do that are rather powerful from a mathematical point of view. Um, there's just tons of stuff there. Another nice geometry thing is something you can maybe see in the thing you just folded, and that has to do with something called Kawasaki's theorem. This is the same Kawasaki that did that rose. Remember the rose picture I showed you? Um, Toshikazu Kawasaki. He, he invented or discovered this theorem that says that if you have a vertex in an origami model that folds flat, and you look at the angles, so this is a purely geometric theorem. It's just looking at the angles around, angles between the creases around that vertex. Then if there are four of them, then these equations have to be true. Then this is saying that this angle plus the opposite angle has to equal 180, and the other pair of opposite angles has to equal 180. And that that's and that's true no matter for anything you see. And so like a more even a so that so this is what it would look like. This is what Kawasaki's theorem looks like if you have four creases. If you have more, it would be like alpha one plus alpha three plus alpha five would equal 180, and alpha two plus alpha four plus alpha six would equal 180, and it would just keep going like that. Or another way of saying it is that yeah, you add up all like the odd every other angle, and then the other every other angle pair, and you could like subtract them, and they'd all add, have to add up to zero. What's cool about this is that this is a way, this is actually what's called in math a necessary and sufficient condition. This is a way to look at a crease pattern, like this crane crease pattern, and say, and, and you can check every single vertex. Will you fold flat? Will you fold flat? All you have to do is check this equation about the angles. So just from looking at the angles, you can see whether a vertex will fold flat or not. That's really, really useful. Um, another thing that's really kind of fun is, and totally different, is think of your crease pattern as a graph. So in math, um, in math, uh, uh, we often refer to a graph as a network of points and lines, not necessarily something you would draw, you know, like like a graph of y equals x squared or something like that. So this network of points and lines that the crease lines make is we think of it as a graph. And you can prove by doing some clever hand waving and, and other things that um, you give me a flat origami model. And look, at, and look at his crease pattern, and I can prove that I can two-color the regions in it. And that means, that's like the four-color theorem, if you've heard of that. But here we're only using two colors. I want to use two colors, and the rule is no two regions that share an edge can get the same color. And I actually have one of these here. I made a crane and colored it, and this is what it would look like. The question I have for you is, what's it going to look like when I fold it back up? You already know the answer, Marcus. It's gold. It's gold. No, it does not turn into gold. Um, so what's going to happen as I fold it up? Here, I'm going to start folding it again. Ah, yes. Fold this up. Fold that. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense because wherever there's a crease, that means those two regions are pointing in opposite directions. So this is actually a really neat result for um, uh, a type of analysis on origami and paper folding processes that's called computational origami. Because here's an open problem. Write a piece of computer software that mimics or simulates origami perfectly. So that I, if I, so that I could virtually on the computer program fold Zhong Mai Kao as devil by saying, OK, here's a square piece of paper. Fold this over there, fold this over there, blah, blah, blah. Oh, look, now I have the devil. No one's been able to do that. Origami is too computationally complicated. People have made good efforts and can do a lot, but no one's been able to capture the richness of origami in something a computer can keep track of. But this is something, this, this is a good start. This is something you could say, 
the computer could look at the potential crease pattern and be like, oh, I know each, I know the direction every face is supposed to be folded into. And so that's neat, but there's other things going on that are way more complicated. It's like, you can oh. color both sides of this sheet? Um, I did not in this one. If you, because here, uh, if the other side of the sheet is, it, like, what would have to happen if, if I fold, if I colored the other side of the sheet, the other side of this would have to be white because it's going in the other direction. So it'd have to be like the reverse coloring. It didn't have the same effect, I think. But for this one, I didn't bother because I'm not seeing the other side. Oh, is, oh. is that typical that you only see one side and you get the whole? No, thing sometimes through? you don't like like this, this zebra. <laughs> this is a piece of paper that's black on one side, white on the other. It was invented by a guy named John Montrall, and it's he's amazing too. He's a really and, yeah. So this, if you did it, you'd have to color both sides, like you said, to, to see the same effect. Um, but because they're opposite sides, they better get different colors. Um, all right. Uh, I want to show you how matrix algebra or linear algebra fits into origami. Um, this is really kind of wild. And this gets into some of the really strong applications of origami. Uh, so this is something that folds into a 3D corner, but it could be anything. This, this is close to it, but it isn't exactly it. But the idea is that if I want to model, say, this flat piece of paper folding into some 3D shape, then what's really happening is I can think of it as, say, taking one part of the paper like this, this part, holding it fixed, and then rotating all the other parts of the paper around these various crease lines. And rotations can be modeled really well by these things that are called rotation matrices. Um, you just think of like any other point. So this part is, is fixed, and I take any other point, x, y, z, here, and I multiply it by this rotation matrix, and that might tell me how it rotates, say, along this crease, which might be on the y-axis, for example. And so I need a rotation matrix for that, and then a rotation matrix for this one, and that one, or this one. And I want them to, I want it to work. I want them all to kind of, you know, rotate in the proper direction. But all I would need is multiplying together matrices like that. And, um, and there's a really nice theorem, again, that stems from Kawasaki, although he didn't actually prove it. And so Bob Castro and I proved it in, uh, uh, a number of years later. Um, that says that if you want to check where there's something like this, together with, so this is a crease pattern, but it also tells me what, how much I need to fold each crease by in order to get the object I want. Um, then if I want to check whether this will actually fold, um, or in particular fold rigidly, like so that each plane of the paper is rigid and not like wriggly or something, then I need to compute the rotation matrices for each one of these crease lines, multiply them together, and if I get the identity, we're good to go. And that kind of makes sense, because it's like saying, well, if I was to go around in a circle like this, I'd want all these rotations after I do them all to get me back to where I started. And that's kind of what the identity is doing. Um, so that ends up being a really powerful result, but look, we're modeling origami by multiplying matrices together. That's not exactly something you would have expected. Um, and uh, yeah, like, so, so this ends up capturing, capturing the same relationships as what engineers would call a kinematic model of uh, uh, folding, say, a rigid bar uh, a linkage or something like that. Um, in other words, things like this make engineers really happy. They're like, oh, wow, that means I could, like, make this out of a, a metal or something like that. And, and that's what people are beginning to do. It also gives you some crazy equations. So, like, look, this is, okay, this is like all sorts of strange trick going on here. But basically, if I was to use that matrix equation on a, uh, a vertex with four creases like this, where the folding angles are these phi's that go around it, you can get these relationships between the folding angles that in order for it to fold up. And you end up with these crazy equations, but look at this for a second. This is kind of cool. This is like, because what do we have here? Here we have phi two and phi one, and they're inside tangents, okay? Phi one and phi two, that's how much I'm folding those two creases up there, okay? And it equals blah, all right? But look at blah. Blah is alpha one, alpha four, alpha one, alpha four, in a sign with some over twos. Um, those are just the angles between the creases. Alpha 1 and alpha 4. Okay? That doesn't change. But these will. As I'm folding and unfolding this, those folding angles are going to change. Okay? So this thing is going to keep changing, but this won't. 
the angle, as I'm folding and unfolding this, these angles here, inside here, don't change at all. So this gives me a really powerful relationship that, yeah, these two folding angles can have to change, but they have to follow this relationship that if I take, divide them by two and take their tangents and look at the ratio, that's got to give me a constant. <laughs> Mathematicians love that stuff. And actually, engineers do too. Because um, that gives you a way of calculating, and that's what this equation is. If I say, all right, I'm going to let phi1 be 30 degrees, fold by 30 degrees, then I can calculate what phi2 must be. And that gives me a way to parameterize this folding and unfolding process. And in fact, that allows us to simulate folding like that. So this is virtual folding on Mathematica. No humans have touched, well, you know. Um, <laughs> but but it's, it, all I'm doing here is letting, say, this angle go from uh, zero degrees, no, totally unfolded, to 180 degrees, totally folded. And I can calculate what all the other angles are. And that means I really understand what's going on here. And what we want to do is then chain that together for lots of other things. And you can here. One uh, was in, ninth, in 2008, I had a summer student, Ben Kraft, who was a high school student at the time. He just graduated from MIT, I believe, or was about to. No, he just graduated. And he did this. This was cool. This is a square twist. And he, he, he decided, again, because it's virtual, we can, make it pass, we can make the paper pass through itself. So this is folding nice and nice. And then all of a sudden it goes whoop. And now all the mountains and valleys have switched and it passed through itself, which is kind of cute. But it's all using that matrix stuff to model how this is happening. And it gives us a lot of insight as to how, what rules would have to be followed if we were going to actually do this in, say, sheet metal or in an actual application. Um, so Robert Lang, who we heard about at the beginning, has actually captured a lot of this math and put it into a software package so that other people can use this, and this is like a virtual crane that flaps its wings that he did on Mathematica, which is kind of cool. I don't have an animation of that. But, but this stuff just never ends. So this is something called the Miura Ori, or the Miura Map Fold. Um, again, virtually modeled using the same kinds of equations. But this, this has a good story to it. Okay? Um, so before I talk about this, where is this coming from? The Miura Map Fold was invented by a Japanese astrophysicist named Koryo Miura. And he wanted a way to put really big solar panels into outer space for satellites. How do you do that? Solar panels are big. The bigger your solar panel, the more energy you get, the more rocking your satellite will be. Um, but you can't just stick a huge, sat, huge solar panel on top of a rocket. It'll wobble. Bad things will happen. So instead, he wanted a way to collapse the solar panel so it can fit inside a capsule and then unfold without the aid of human hands in outer space. Right? And so he came up with this fold. It's really kind of neat. You just, it, it folds into this com compact thing, and then you pull two opposite corners together, and boom. And, wow. and you can just do that with like some expansion rod in outer space and not worry. It won't catch on itself. It'll just. As opposed to the. That's amazing. As opposed to the solar panels on the International Space Station, which are just accordion pleated, and they, one time they had to collapse them in like 2001 or 2002. And they buckled, and they had to get a, a guy to spacewalk and actually do origami in outer space. I wish I could have done that. <laughs> <laughs> or push all the mountains and valleys in the right direction again. If only they had used the mirror map pole, but it was probably patented, so maybe that's what it is. So this has been studied a lot by physicists, by engineers. Um, some people have even found this pattern in nature a little bit with like leaves that unfold because it's a very, it, it, it's a very economical way of collapsing things. And there's other properties this has, like something called negative Poisson ratio that makes the physicists go wild. Um, that, that, I barely understand that. That's like, normally if you have something like a sponge or a hunk of soap or something like that and you squeeze it in one direction, what's it going to do in the other direction? Stretch, right? You squeeze it, it goes bleh in the other direction. Here, is something which, if I squeeze it in this direction, what does the other direction do? It collapses. Yeah. That's different than what things should do when you squeeze them. And so, so physicists are like, that makes this something called a metamaterial. And, and, and that's like a big word in, in, in uh, oh, what's the field? In uh, the physics of things. Right? <laughs> material, material science, material physics, uh, there's something else, I'm forgetting the word, it's okay. Um, I've been talking to physicists a lot for the past couple of years. We don't know the word either. Yeah, right. So, um, yeah, uh, condensed matter physics. They 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 love this stuff. Anyway, um, so I, I I always liked this, and I, I had long asked, been curious about this question. 
that, okay, the, the nice way of folding up the Muir map fold is this way. With, and, and you can look at this and see what, what are mountains and what are valleys when I hold it up like this. But what if I change the mountains and valleys? Um, can I? For, is there not other, other ways I could fold this? There actually are. Um, I'm a little afraid to do it with this one because this one's kind of old. But, uh, um, but I might have another one that I could do if I can find it. Um, but, um, oh yeah, this is it. Yeah, here's another mirror already that I can manipulate. Like, instead of having it collapse like this, okay, this is where I always like, you know, try to do origami live and bad things can happen. So if instead <laughs> I fold it like that and try to collapse it this way, will that work? Yeah. There's another way to collapse it. Wow. But notice that it's gotten locked in parts. It doesn't, it doesn't open and close as nicely anymore. It's, it's, things have gotten a little bit changed. But that's because I changed some of the mountains and valleys. <laughs> and magically made the lights turn off. Uh, Someone probably leaned against the light switch. Yes. Yeah, that was useless. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I actually asked one of my students at Western New England University, hey, let's work on this. Can, can you just, I taught her how to fold the mirror, map fold, and I was like, make some small models and try to see if you can count how many ways there are to fold these things, uh, uh, how many different mountain valley assignments can you make? And she discovered by just generating lots of data that the numbers you get for how many ways I can change the mountains and valleys and say um, and m parallelograms by n parallelograms mirror grid, uh, that those numbers are exactly the same numbers you get when you try to properly three color this grid graph of m vertices by n vertices. And the, you know, graph theory and common torques people I know love this stuff because they're like, this is a problem people have studied. So again, this is, this is like a map coloring problem. You want to color these vertices um, either green, well, green, blue, or purple, and you don't want two neighboring vertices to get the same color. How many ways can you do that? Although actually, in this case, we want one vertex to be pre-colored. So this one, we're going to say, we want that to be blue or zero, here I'm calling it. And then how many ways can you color the others? That turn, the, the numbers you get for that will be the same as the number of ways you can fold up that thing. So there's this weird connection, again, between graph theory and, and these things. And it turns out the physicists I was talking with were really interested in this question because they wanted to know if they, if they wanted to get, say, uh, make something self-fold a mirror map fold, they don't want it to fold incorrectly. They don't want it to misfold somehow. They want it to fold the right way. So knowing how many ways it can misfold is very useful to knowing what you can avoid. Yeah, question. Is there a specific reason why, so it says zero, 1, and then it's like blue and green, and then it's two zero at the bottom, and then if you see there's like a pattern, so they're all diagonal, mm -hmm. it's like blue, green, blue, green, but then it's like green and purple, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is there a reason why it changed for those two? Yeah, that's, blue, well that's because green. it turns out there's a bijection between that the way, the way you prove these numbers are the same is you show a bijection, a way of going back and forth between my mountain valley assignment and the coloring of the vertices. And it's, I'm not going to go into the details because there's other things I want to talk about in the remaining you know, five or so minutes we have. But, um, but you basically do this zigzagging path and every time, and you start with, <coughs> you start with the top left vertex being zero and you go along this path and every time you hit a mountain crease, you add one mod three Every time you cross a valley crease, you subtract one mod three, and that works. That gives you a valid coloring, if and only if this was a valid mountain valley assignment. You got to prove that, but it's amazing. It's so cool. We were so excited when we discovered that. Yeah. So I mean, that, that, this is kind of the proof, but I'm not going to go into it. Um, there was another question over here. Uh, yeah, you took care of it. I just wanted to know if oh. there was an explicit bijection. Yeah, there is an explicit bijection, and this is it. And you got you got to prove that it works, but. It's cool. It, I'm it's thinking cool. out of the frying pan into the fire. Is there any formula for the number of these three colorings? No. It sounds like it's NP complete or something. Uh, yeah, the decidability question for three coloring is definitely NP complete. I don't know <laughs> if it's complete for grid graphs, but um, or NP for grid graphs. But there is no explicit formula. There's only transfer matrix methods for calculating those things. But then I could use those to do the origami thing because that saved us so much work. It was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So the dough. Oh, and one other thing. And this is again the. I've been really enjoying making the physicists get all excited about this stuff because I showed them this and they were like, wait a minute, that looks really, that coloring, that coloring of that grid graph looks familiar. It turns out that there's a bijection between this coloring, this kind of grid graphs 
and something called the square ice Ising model, which is imagine you have you live in a two-dimensional world where you can make you have water molecules, but they only live in a plane, and you want them to form ice. That means uh, I'm not going to get this right at all, but that <laughs> that means that what, what is what is ice made of? It's made of water. And water has H2O, so it's got an oxygen molecule, an oxygen atom, and two hydrogen atoms. And if it's and they're all bonded together, and let's say they're bonded together in a square lattice. And in order for them to be ice, they have to compress together as much as possible, right? And that means that your so if you have an oxygen molecule, it has got two hydrogens, two hy two hy molecule uh, atom, oxygen <coughs> atom. You have two hydrogen atoms. Then the hydrogen atoms could like be pushed close together, but then the oxygen atom that's over here would have to have, uh, no, no, I'm going to get this they right. They expand, actually, when they do ice. Oh, they expand. Uh, then I'm going the other way. Well, whatever. But, but, if uh, but if the oxygens are in a lattice, oxygen, 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 then the hydrogen atoms have to kind of compress or expand in a way that it all fits together nicely. And these are like the six ways they could do it. Here the arrows are indicating the directions that the nearest hydrogen atoms are going. Are they compressing or expanding in that direction or the opposite? Are, are, are these two going in and those two going away? Um, and calculating the number of ways you could have that. So the number of ways you could have ice forming on a two-dimensional lattice. Uh, a guy named Elliot Lieb in like that, the 1960s proved that that was the same as this graph coloring, three graph coloring problem. And then proved asymptotically that if you have lots and lots of atoms, so if n is the number of hydrogen or, or water molecules you have, where n is like 10 to the 23 because it's like huge, then the number of ways to do this is like two thirds, no, four thirds to the three n over two. It grows exponentially, it's really big. And that means the mirror map fold. If I was gonna make a mirror map fold with 10 to the 23 parallelograms, the number of mountain valley assignments would be approximately this as well. <laughs> it's great when you get all these results so you don't have to do anything because people already did it for you. Okay, um, I'm running out of time a little bit. Let me just quickly mention one other thing that came out of the, the results, and that's these things called forcing sets. So the group I've been working with at, at the University of Massachusetts in Cornell are, again, they're really interested in self-folding, and I want to show you some cool pictures of, from that. But, um, uh, but if I was going to make something like the mirror map fold uh, fold up on its own, so like in outer space that wouldn't be so bad. I'd just have to construct one of these things and, again, have an expansion rod or something. <laughs> But if I was going to make, like, make it in a different medium, like the people I work with want to make things that are really small, and I'll show you some pictures of those, uh, then they have to program all the creases to fold. And that can be kind of expensive. So if I was going to like, make something really tiny that does this, then i got to make every crease somehow you know, fold and unfold the way it's supposed to. And that just might be a pain in the butt. What would be much easier is if I could find a subset of the creases and make them fold, that force all the other creases to just go along for the ride and give me this. That's what's, that, so that's what I call a minimal forcing set. Um, is there, and that, so the, the idea is, can I find, if, if, if I have um, a crease pattern C, can I find the smallest subset F of the creases so that if uh, the creases in F are active and folding in some way, then all the other creases will <laughs> fold the way we want them to. Um, so, and it's turned out to be difficult, but a group of people and I labeled that Zach Abel, Brad Bellinger, um, uh, uh, Muriel uh, Damien, Eric Domain, David Epstein, uh, Robin Flatland, and myself, we came up with, um, uh, oh, and Jessica Jennifer, I didn't put her on there. Um, we came up with a way of doing this for the mirror map fold. And what's cool is that it has to do with domino tilings. Like, this is so fun. You take your mirror map fold and you lay dominoes across the parallelograms so that every parallelogram has at least half of a domino on it. And then those are the creases that are going to be in your forcing set. All the others will be forced. This is a really neat relationship between the classic mirror map fold and, and domino tiles. And that gives us that uh, we only need to have m and over 2 creases in our forcing set. All the others will be, will be forced. Um, now that is kind of cool. But this is a mathematical theoretical result. 
We tried doing this in the lab with something, and it didn't work so well. <laughs> let, let me tell you about that. So, so, what, so these are Ryan Hayward and Chris Santangelo are two physicists, two materials physicists at uh, the University of Massachusetts. Itai Cohen is also a materials physicist at Cornell University. And Ryan, in particular, came up with this great way of getting tiny little things to cell fold using, um, using polymer gels. Have you ever played with grow animals? Yes. You stick them in water, they grow. That type of material has a fancy name that's probably somewhere on this slide. Uh, it's, uh, no, it's going to be on another slide. Um, but but so, so what they did is they took some of that grow animal stuff, stuck it in the middle here, and sandwiched it with a rigid polystyrene of some kind. And then um, and, 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 and kind of layered them on top of each other, uh, what they call cross-linked them with each other, but then carved creases in the top and bottom of the rigid layers. So they'd have like a, uh, a, a trough here. And imagine what happens when we then dunk this in water. Yeah, th this part will swell, but these parts won't. And that will give us creases. So if I want to make a mountain crease, I put the gap on the top layer, and the whole thing will bend, because the top part there will swell, and the others can't. And I want to value because I put it on the bottom. And so we can like program creases in there. And they got this to work really well. This is just one crease folding. And depending on the width of the gap, that determines how much it folds. So we can actually control the folding angle as well. That's really cool. It gives us a lot of control. Okay. Um, so, so actually, we, uh, the, the four of us got an NSF grant to explore this idea and develop it, and it worked really well. We got, after a bunch of trial and error, we got the mirror map fold to work. So this is the mirror map fold de-swelling. It's already, it's already <coughs> swelled and folded, and here it, we're drying it out, and it's like unswelling, and then it's going to swell again. Yeah, here it is. Mm -hmm. So this is, really, this is less than a millimeter wide. This is really small. Wow. And it's soft polymer gel. It's a type of material that could be biocompliant. So for applications that people have been dreaming about using origami in like biomechanical uh, work, this could be useful. We also wanted to do some representational origami. Here's Randlitz's flopping bird. Well, actually, it's a variation of it that Robert Lang helped us design. Um, and this is the crease pattern. And this, this is a blown up uh, uh, confocal electron microscopy image of it. Uh, notice it's 100, uh, what is that? Uh, micrometers. Yeah. There it is, next to a grain of rice. <laughs> let's, let's zoom in on that so you can actually see it a little bit. Uh, yeah, there it is. It kind of looks like it, right? Uh, but, that, but this is a better picture of it, used, using an electron microscope to, to image it. Um, th this, and so then they came to me and they were like, okay, Tom, do we think this really works? Can you give us something? Because the problem with this is that the only way, at least right now, the only way they have for this to work is for everything to self-fold at once. They don't have a good way of sequentially getting this to work. So that some creases fold and others. So they wanted something really complicated that would all self-fold. And I was like, Hey, let's do my favorite 3D origami tessellation. I have one of them here. Um, this is the crease pattern. And um, this, uh, this, this is a really nice one that a bunch of people, including myself, have, have discovered. And um, it makes a 3D, uh, what's called an octet truss. So this is th that, which is something that comes out of architecture and is really interesting. If you, go, if you were to go to a sports arena and look at the ceiling and see what kind of grid, uh, what kind of like lattice mechanism is holding up the ceiling, there's a good chance it'll be an octet truss. It's, a, it's octahedra and tetrahedra like lattice together to make a really, really strong um, framework. Uh, but this is the origami version. It opens and closes really nicely. Yeah. So this is that grease pattern you're seeing. And when it comes together, there's some of these triangles that form tetrahedra and come together. And then you got these octahedra in between them. It's really kind of fun. But it requires everything to fold together and fold together in just the right way. And I'm not going to show you the first attempts that we did with that, because they didn't work at all. But once, once the, uh, the postdoc got the folding angles right, it worked pretty well. So, so this is it de-swelling. OK, I'm going to have to show you that again, because it was kind of fast. So because th th that was the better movie we got, was it de-swelling. Um, Can okay. you do it more than once? Can the actual? Oh, yeah, we've been de-swelling and swelling and de -swelling. Yeah, this is repeatable, if that's what you mean. We dry it out, we get it wet again, we dry it out. Oh, okay. And it keeps working. I mean, I don't know what the actual limit is. Um, but notice it's not completely formed there, and then it de-swells. 
And then it gets out of the focus plane too, so it's kind of hard to see. But then we got an electron microscopy image of it, and um, after letting it soak for a couple more hours, it all really came together. And this is, as far as I know, I mean, so a lot of people have been working on self-folding processes. There are engineers who are really uh, interested in, um, oh, what are they called, uh, compliant metals um, uh, or shaped metal alloys that, that can be programmed to self-fold. But they're still having a hard time getting one crease to do exactly what they want. And with this, we can, this had like hundreds of creases in it all working together. And yeah, that's just been really exciting. So the morals here um, behind all of this is that, uh, well, first of all, the math involved in paper folding is pretty extensive. It isn't just geometry. It isn't just, you know, little things. There's lots of different ways in which origami and math intersect. And the applications are actually... There's some rather unexpected applications, I think. Um, a lot of the work that's being done now, uh, and a lot of it is getting NSF support, uh, or at least has been recently, um, uh, is, uh, is very interesting. In fact, um, one of the postdocs on our grant was telling me that he, he went to a physics conference just uh, last, no, earlier this year, and he was like, there's so many origami talks now. It's getting to be kind of like, like uh, a cliche or something. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I don't mind. The challenge is, is uh, for us and for myself as a mathematician is to try to collect all this stuff and make it more uniform so that we're not reinventing the wheel as much and so that it's easier for people to kind of get on the bandwagon and learn this stuff. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, potential for that. So uh, with that, I thank you for paying attention. Oh, wow.